Welcome to the Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. To support Murder in 20, feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Growing up, Christy Marac had always dreamed of being a teacher. She was fun-loving and spunky. Her smile always lit up a room and she could brighten anyone's day. She was a middle child of Vincent and Jerry and grew up with her sister Alicia and brother Vince. Christy and her mom were always very close, just like sisters. She wasn't afraid of hard work and was financially very responsible and sometimes worked three jobs, one as a waitress at a country club, another as a cashier at a pharmacy. She was outgoing and friendly, active in high school, a member of the PEP club, student council, school newspaper, and the yearbook. Christy was someone people could count on. She was one of 100 students who graduated from Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic High School in Shemokin in 1985 and immediately went to Millersville University in Lancaster County, a two-hour drive from her family. Although five foot seven, she was petite with a thin frame. She'd originally moved to Lancaster City, but later, concerned for her safety, moved to a two-story brick townhouse on William Penn Way in East Lampeter. She shared it with two roommates and more quiet neighbors. When one of her roommates got married, it was just her and Mary left. Christy was always cautious about safety. There was a piece of wood in the track of the patio doors, so they couldn't be opened from the outside. The lock on the front door automatically locked when closed, and there was a peephole in the front door that she would use before letting anyone in. By now, she was comfortable being at the townhouse she'd lived in for four years. Christy graduated in 1989 and had majored in elementary education. She continued to work part-time jobs in the summer until she started her first teaching job at Warston Elementary in Lancaster. Her first year, she taught remedial reading and had started her second year doing the same thing. Then, she got an opportunity to take over a class of first graders. She did so well at it that when an opening for a sixth grade teacher became available, she was invited to apply and got the job. She was well-liked by both the students and the faculty, her enthusiasm was contagious. She could be seen bouncing down the hallway with her blonde ponytail bobbing. Christy was the all-American girl. She didn't have many boyfriends, but that's because she had one very special man in her life, and he was an older married man. She'd met Ken while she was at a bar with friends, and despite their 20-year age difference, they'd hit it off. She was drawn to his charm, wit, and humor. And Christy was a private person. Plus, she didn't want to worry her mother, so they were discreet. Ken's wife had moved to another city for business reasons, and they had a long-distance relationship. But it looked like he finally might be moving to join her, and his relationship with Christy would be changing. The weekend before Christmas in 1992 was a busy one for Christy. The Sunday News reported that Friday after school, she dropped her brother off at a mall parking lot where her mom met them to take her brother home for the holidays. She had plans to follow in a couple days. That evening, she had plans with Ken, but he stood her up, which wasn't unusual. But later that night, he showed up at her townhouse and stayed until morning. On Saturday, she went Christmas shopping with friends, and an old friend had come to stay for the weekend. Saturday night, they went bar hopping and stayed out late. Christy didn't go to church Sunday morning as usual, nor did she stop by the school to prepare for the week as she usually did. Around noon, her friend left, and an hour later, a neighbor stopped by to chat. She popped up to a market, then returned to decorate the townhouse for Christmas and wrap gifts. 
Christy had bought 40 presents for her students, a book titled Miracles on Maple Hill by Virginia Sorensen. She wrapped each book individually with a candy cane on top and a personal message wishing them a Merry Christmas and signed it, Love, Miss Marac. She piled the gifts along the small tree by the front door to take to school the next morning. There were only four more days until Christmas. Christy got up as usual before 6 a.m. Her routine was to go downstairs, have breakfast, and wrap herself in a blanket and watch the news before getting ready for work. She was upstairs getting dressed when her roommate left around 7 a.m. Fifteen minutes later, she was dressed and headed downstairs. She had to grab her lunch out of the fridge and take the gifts out to her car. She put on her coat and gloves and opened the front door and stared into the eyes of a monster. She let out a loud scream. He pushed her back into the apartment and closed the door. He picked her up. Her shoe left a scuff mark on the top of the door. Then he dragged her, her shoe scraping across the floor. Christmas gift gift bags and cushions were strewn about. Christy was a fighter and fought him with everything she had. Somehow, she grabbed a wooden cutting board from the kitchen and tried to fend him off. But he took it from her, overpowered her, and beat her with it, breaking her jaw and disfiguring her face. Her elbows and knees were badly bruised. After the sexual assault, he put his hands around her neck and squeezed. He tied her sweater around her neck, left her body sprawled on the floor, and casually strolled out of her townhouse and no one saw a thing. When she didn't arrive at school by her usual 8 a.m., Principal Harry Goodman was very concerned. It wasn't like Christy. She was dependable, and if she couldn't make it, she would have called. He phoned her home several times and got her answering machine, so he phoned her mother to ask if she had visited Shemokin on the weekend, but she hadn't. Her mother grew very concerned and called Christy over and over. Meanwhile, Harry hopped in his car and drove the short 15-minute drive to Christie's. He parked, and as he neared the front door, he noticed it wasn't completely closed. It was slightly ajar. He pushed it open and looked inside the living room. He saw Christmas presents flung all over the room and a lot of blood. Then he saw Christie's lifeless body and ran out, closing the door behind him. The Lancaster New Era reported that he pounded on neighbors' doors until he found someone home. Across the parking lot, Anthony and Nancy Orsi opened their door to see a man in a suit, blurting out, This is an emergency. I think someone was raped and murdered. I have to use your phone to call 911. After making the call, Anthony and Harry walked over to Christie's home, just as police and ambulance arrived. Police found the door locked from when Harry had closed it, and the officer kicked it in. At 9.55 a.m., the coroner pronounced Christy dead. She was only 25. By 11 a.m., a dozen officers were at the murder site. Some officers were inside the townhouse. Others were knocking on neighbors' doors. Inside Christy's car, a blue Honda Prelude, it was clean and tidy. A fur hat rested on the back seat, and on the passenger side was a cassette from the rock band The Black Crows. She had good taste in music. Inside the townhouse, the phone kept ringing. At 11.45 a.m., an officer finally answered it and told her mother that she needed to come to Lancaster, that there'd been an accident, and Christy was dead. Her roommate, Mary, returned to the townhouse and was interviewed by police. By 1 p.m. that afternoon, police told the media that it appeared Christy had been strangled and that her murder likely happened between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. and that they had not made an arrest. The Standard Speaker newspaper reported that afternoon a school of students had gathered for an assembly to watch the school's production of Trouble in Toyland when the teachers were pulled aside and told of Christie's murder. Counselors, support staff from other schools, and clergy from several churches 
were brought in to help the teachers break the sad news to the school's 450 children. And at the end of the day, Harry sent a letter home with the 6th grade students to inform their parents of the day's tragedy. That night, police worked on the case until 11 p.m. They removed several boxes of potential evidence from the townhouse and wrapped yellow police tape around the residence and sealed the front door with red plastic tape. Attached to it was a no-trespassing sign. The next morning, police stopped vehicles traveling in and out of the townhouse complex to ask if they'd seen anything suspicious the day before. At 9.30 a.m., Chrissy's autopsy began, and meanwhile, a dozen investigators were at the crime scene. They didn't find any other weapons, just the cutting board. On Tuesday, outside Christie's Elementary School, the U.S. flag hung at half-mast. Then on Wednesday, police announced that they believe Christie may have known her killer, and that they were questioning friends anyone she knew, and a man that she dated. The first assistant district attorney revealed that a number of instruments were used to attack her, but would not provide further details. They believed she was not selected at random. The time of the attack had been narrowed down to between 7 a.m. when her roommate left and 7.45 a.m. when she usually left for work. Investigators were continuing to canvass the neighborhood, Greenfield Estates was a large complex of multiple clusters of townhouses. Christie's was located in a cluster that was shaped like a horseshoe, with townhouses on the outside all facing inward, with two rows of parking along the inside so that each tenant parked in front of their home. Christie's townhouse was on the corner of the main street, and across from her townhouse was the overflow parking lot for visitors. On Saturday, December 26, Christie's funeral mass was held at the St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Shemokin. Many of her fellow teachers and sixth grade students attended. Ken was also there and met her parents for the first time. The Sunday News reported, and I quote, On a quiet hillside, surrounded by the mountains of the Pennsylvania coal country in which she grew up, Christiane Marac was laid to rest. Her life cut short by violence four days before Christmas. As the mass drew to a close, the casket which had remained closed, draped in white, was brought down the aisle of the old church, accompanied by Christie's parents, her sister Alicia, and her brother Vince, as the procession moved into the bright sunshine and winter chill. She was laid to rest at All Saints Cemetery. A week after her murder, police learned of a suspicious car that had been parked in the overflow parking lot across from Christie's at 7 a.m. that morning. After parking the car, the male was seen getting out and walking in the direction of her townhouse. Police appealed for that person to come forward. A few days later, police issued more details in a Crime Stoppers bulletin. The male was white and muscular, and the car was white possibly a 1993 Dodge Shadow Convertible or a 1990 Dodge Daytona or a Toyota. By mid-January, police had interviewed over 100 people and were still looking for that white car. They'd interviewed Christie's boyfriend, Ken, and he was cooperative, took numerous polygraph tests, and passed them all. They obtained a search warrant for blood and hair samples for a 31-year-old local man in early February. Then in April, when the crime lab results came back, police reported that the man was cleared. They also reported that another 10 suspects had been cleared using DNA testing and polygraph tests. They were still appealing to the public for the driver of that white car to come forward. Christie's family offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of her killer. And by mid-April... Police interviews had grown to a staggering 500. Police now released that there had been no forced entry and that they still believe she knew her killer. In early May, the Intelligencer Journal reported that police released a composite drawing of another man 
and asked for the public's help in locating him. On the morning she had been murdered, he was seen walking on Pitney Road, the street behind Christie's townhouse. His car was a light blue Ford Taurus. The man was described as in his late 20s, 225 to 250 pounds, stocky, muscular build, long, stringy, medium brown hair that hung to his chest, clean-shaven, deep-set eyes, wearing a blue, white, and black faded shirt and blue jeans. By June, police officials were saying that perhaps Christy did not know her attacker, and that muscular man walking from the white car, the mystery had been solved. Turned out, he was a neighbor's son. Officials had completed 50 polygraph tests on Christy's acquaintances. They didn't believe she had been harassed or stalked before her murder. In July, police released information on a new vehicle they were searching for. New witnesses had come forward, and it was a faded silver 1987 to 1991 Dodge Daytona hatchback with black louvers in the back window and roll-up style headlights. A white man with an athletic build had gotten out of the car and headed towards Christie's house. In November, the Sunday News reported on Jerry's visit to her daughter's grave, and I quote, It rained hard that November day, the raw weather giving way to a thick fog that forced its way between the Northumberland County hills. Even the sun would not shine on a mother in mourning. Through the dreariness, Jerry steered her car out of Shimokin traffic along winding back roads and into a rural cemetery. She walked through wet grass and knelt at a grave marked by a plaque and a vase of flowers. Her daughter had left her native coal country behind to become a teacher in Lancaster. Now, she was home to stay. A year after her murder, Christy's parents were still waiting for news of her killer. Every day, they looked at the answering machine in their living room, hoping the light was blinking. And sometimes it was, but never with the news they'd hoped for. An FBI profile described the murderer as someone 25 to 35 years old who was an observer, wouldn't be the center of attention or stand out in a crowd. He likely hadn't killed before, but he might have committed date rape. He may have gone into a rage and killed Christy when she rejected him or fought him off. The years lingered on, and the 10th anniversary of her murder was approaching. Her mother was dying of cancer and asked the Sunday News for an interview. With her son and daughter by her side, she talked about her frustration and her fear that she would die before her killer was found. Less than two months later, she passed away on November 4, 2002. She was buried beside her daughter. A few months later, the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit in Quantico, Virginia, updated their profile of the killer, as well as releasing details they'd kept secret. The FBI predicted that he would be reading everything he could about Christy. He needed to know if the police were getting close. He was a man who had difficulty controlling his temper and may be violent with women, and that he may have not intended to kill her that day. It may have been a sexual assault that escalated. He may have committed other sexual assaults before or after. He may say negative things about her or law enforcement, and afterwards he may have changed his behavior or his appearance. Police were hoping that anyone who may have noticed someone doing these things would contact them. In November 2017, 25 years had passed since Christie's murder, a new technology developed by Parabon Nano Labs called Snapshot helped the FBI release an age composite drawing of what her killer may have looked like at ages 25, 45, and 55. Parabon uses a DNA sample to predict physical appearance. For example, it can predict hair color, but not hairstyle. Parabon Snapshot has been helping police investigations since 2015. Two months after that snapshot, Parabon had developed new technology, genetic genealogy, and C.C. Moore 
got to work doing what she does best. We first introduced you to Cece in our episode of Angie Dodge, The Tree Roots Ran Deep. Parabon submits a DNA provided by investigators to a public genealogy site, and when they get a match, they hand that information to Cece, who builds a family tree. She scours public records, newspaper archives, and obituaries to narrow it down. Then, when she has a name, she hands it over to investigators, who check out that person's background to see if it's possible. In this case, their suspect lived four miles from Christie at the time, and his vehicle was a white Toyota that matched witness reports that morning, but he had never been on investigators' radar. On May 31st, 2018, undercover agents followed the suspect in hopes of obtaining a discarded DNA sample. He was a DJ working at an event at a local elementary school. Patiently, they waited. They watched him use a water bottle and leave it. Then, he dropped a used piece of gum into a cup. They scooped up the evidence and sent it to the state police crime lab. Eight days later, they got the news Christie's family had been waiting a lifetime to hear. It was a match. A little over two weeks later, they arrested Raymond Freeze at his home in Lancaster County. He was 49 years old. His claim to fame was working at events that involved Sting, the Eagles, and Paris Hilton, among other celebrities. Interestingly, he was engaged at the time, and after the murder got married. His wife claimed she had no idea. Raymond was charged with first-degree murder and rape. In January 2019, 26 years after Christie's murder, he admitted that he killed her. Although in court he apologized to her family, he did not offer a motive. The only connection he may have had to her is a ticket stub investigators found in her wallet for live music, the Chameleon Club, where Raymond had been the DJ. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, a sentence of 60 to 120 years. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20, with less talk and more true crime. It's been six months and 27 episodes since we launched, and we'd like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in every week. We'll be taking a two-week break for the holidays and wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. We'll be back Wednesday, January 6, 2021, with a whole year of exciting and intriguing episodes. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And every week, we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. Mm-hmm.